Hallelujah. There's one sock. There's another sock. Meadow, your socks will be not your socks. His socks will be up here on the front pew. All right, Liam. Bye, bye, buddy. All right, listen, we, we're coming off of a series. I just absolutely love these Wednesday night meat eater Bible studies because they're not for the weak and timid. Because you see, the people who come on Sunday, we can be packed on a Sunday. But those that have a serious desire and a hunger and thirst for God will show up on a Wednesday night. Wednesday nights are always special. That's why you get what's special. We're coming off of probably an eight-part series if you follow us on television or YouTube or or in our church, wherever you're hearing this at. We're doing an eight-part series and um, on the holy days or holidays. And I mean, we've just, we've swept it. And there's this battle. I mean, I've been studying this week. I mean, I've, I've spent more time just meditating and studying because of the truth that God is giving us. You know, when the, when the angel Gabriel told Daniel, he said that wisdom, Wisdom in the last days will increase. I thank God that I don't know just what I knew 40 years ago when I began studying this Bible. I mean, we got to grow in the things of the kingdom. The Bible talks about different levels in the kingdom. Jesus asked his disciples. He, first of all, he asked them, where, where is the kingdom? You know, people always want to talk or pray to the man upstairs, which I don't really know who they're talking about. If they don't know his name, they can't address him by name. And then I say, I mean, there is just so much to learn. The Bible says that in 1 Corinthians, it says that that Paul said that he wanted to come to them, not to bring them milk any longer. He said, but to bring them meat. He said that we were to desire the, the, the meat of the word, that there are babies, that there are infants in Christ. There are babes in Christ. There is a, a young man in Christ. There's a mature man in Christ. There's different levels in Christ. And that's one of the greatest revelations to learn. Sure, we're concerned about you being saved and accepting Jesus and, and making sure that you're saved by grace and through faith. But what happens after that? That's been the mystery of the kingdom. I mean, I, I listen to some of the greatest teachers. I mean, guys that, that have dedicated their lives to the Word of God. I mean, really just studying and probing into the Word, and I listen to them. You know, the Bible tells us the word to rightly divide the Word of Truth. We're rightly to divide the word of truth. And, and what we believe, and I, I do, I believe the whole Bible, especially the New Testament, the New Covenant, it pivots around Acts 15 and those four decrees found in Acts 15. So when we look at this being Gentile believers, a Gentile is anyone who is not physically born a Jew. Someone who is not physically born a Jew. So we just come off this major series that we're, that we're talking about and we're unveiling the holy days or holidays. Now, I've been on record as saying this. The reason why I did that and the, why, the reason why I do that, it's not to convert us back to Judaism. I'm not all about going backwards in the kingdom. The Jews, and, and I say this with all respect, the Jews really mess things up. I mean, you figure they, they were in slavery for so many years in Egypt. God delivers them out. But he gets this man by the name of Moses and he gets over there and he does all these tremendous signs and wonders. He brings the people out of Egypt. He parts the Red Sea. They go across on dry land. Pharaoh's army is absolutely destroyed. They go off into the wilderness. And when Moses goes up on the mountain to get a word from God, before he could come down off the mountain, they had taken all their jewelry and melted it down and made an image of a golden calf. And when he come down off of that mountain, he saw those people worshiping that golden image. Now listen, I don't know about you, but that's pretty messed up. 
I mean, if God would supernaturally deliver you out of that Egypt in your life, whatever those circumstances are. I mean, all, all of us have some type of baggage or something where God had to deliver us. Thank God that he brings us out of that. Thank God for his mercy and his saving grace. But more importantly, the Holy Spirit that indwells us, that now gives us the power not to be controlled by our circumstances, but to, we're not controlled by our circumstances. We control them. And there's a big difference. People in their lives, if they don't understand who they are in Christ, they could be saved, but they could be miserably saved. But yet Jesus said, I come that they would have life and have life more abundantly. So we need to know how to access that abundant life. I mean, we need to know Christ in that resurrected power that he wants us to walk in. And we need to walk in that abundant life. So as we looked into these, we, we just, this, this thing about the feast days is extremely powerful. And the, way we, the reason why we look at them is because I believe the, the holidays today are nothing beside a means of idolatry. Now I showed how the church, the church was in a period called the Dark Ages. It was 1,500 years after Christ. That hey, we didn't even have the Bible in English. I mean, what set up there in, in, in one church would read out of the Bible every now and then in Latin and tell you what to do? I mean, the Gentile people were really lost. Thank God for the Protestant Reformation. But since that Protestant Reformation, God has been giving men and women revelations. And this is what's advancing the kingdom. It says in Acts 3.21, it says, He, Jesus, is being held in heaven. Well, why is he being held? What's Jesus waiting on? It says that he's being held in heaven until the restoration of all things. Now, to restore something means that you must bring it back to its original condition. If you have a 57 Chevy and it's out there in the woods and it's been there for 10, 15 years and you want to restore that vehicle, you got to bring that vehicle back to its original condition. This is what God's been doing in the church. This is what God has been doing in the church. And I personally believe the things that we're learning, I mean, just like the Passover coming up, I mean, Anybody, and I'm sharing this with as many people as I could possibly share this with. This is 2016. And Estar or Oster, the, the pagan holiday that most Gentiles celebrate. Listen, the majority of the, of the people are out worshiping a rabbit and some eggs coming up here soon in March. But, I mean, they worship that in ignorance because they've never been taught anything different. But I think God has structured it this year in a sense to, to say, hey, look, how can they be celebrating the resurrection if the Passover is not until like April 25th? I think it's March 22nd and April 25th. So in other words, what I'm trying to show you is, is Jesus could have not been resurrected from the dead before he was crucified. They got it backwards. And it's not even a day different, even though a day is a big thing with God because there are certain appointed times that we looked at. Now, if these times have been honored by God, they need to be honored by us. But why hasn't the church been taught these things? Because the church is still coming out of those dark ages. They're coming out of the things that the early Roman church had taught them. Just a form of religion. See, when Constantine came out, there were two different divisions of the world empire. The, the Roman Empire, which they controlled the entire world. There was an eastern division and a western division. Well, when Constantine came down, he conquered the whole western region. He was ruling that. And he wanted to, he wanted to conquer the east. So as he began to migrate that way... All of a sudden, he saw this sign, which was the sun. And 
in the sun, it had a beautiful cross in the middle. In a voice, he said, a voice come out of heaven and told him, by this sign, you shall conquer. And what he did is they went on with that sign of the cross and they went on to conquer. So the Roman Empire became a world empire and they ruled the world. And Constantine struggled with these things at the beginning. I mean, he, he, he had good intentions at some time and at some time he was really messed up. So what he started to do is he started to worship the sun god. And up until about 200 A.D., after the death of Jesus, A.D., after death, let's just say, 200 years after Jesus, the church would only worship on the Sabbath. Until that Roman church declared through Constantine that they would now worship on Sundays. And they worshiped the sun god on Sunday. That's where the word came from. And that's what got him away from celebrating and worshiping on the true Sabbath, which is Saturday. Now, does this mean that we just make an idol out of this and start worshiping that, and then it's all about the Sabbath and this and that? I, I don't care who you are. You're not, you're not fulfilling the law. So we can't even go there. But what we can do is we can draw closer to God through the things that we've learned to observe and the things in His Word that we can do to better improve our service unto Him. Each person walks in their own level of conviction on some of these things. But what He did is He made this mandatory. And many of the church fathers died because of this. And then they also, that's where they implemented Easter. And they said that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Well, we know and the closer we get to that day that they celebrate, I'm really going to reveal, I'm going I'm to teach you how Jesus, there is no way that Jesus was crucified on Good Friday and that he rose from the dead on Sunday. There's no way you could cram three days in, the, in that period. But people just take it for granted. There's so many things that just people take for granted because mommy did that way and, and that daddy did it that way and daddy's daddy did it that way and daddy's daddy daddy did it that way. So then they just, they follow in ignorance. I'd rather have us follow the word of God and know the truth and walk in the truth. But what you're seeing now is you're seeing this increase in knowledge. Listen, you guys got those smartphones them smartphones, man, you can punch anything that I preach or teach in them smartphones, and I'm telling you, you'll find some people that are preaching it. Now, they may not preach it in its entirety because each one of us has our own part. Each person has their own revelation. I mean, that's how God gets it into the earth. How else is God going to get his word into the earth? I mean, he, he could put a big billboard up there in the sky. But as far as I know, he hasn't done that yet. He's chosen to speak through men and women. But he speaks to them through his word. We know the Bible tells us in John 1 that in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. See, that's why it's so important to know this word. Listen, there's, no, there's nothing more important to you on this earth than this word. Nothing. I don't care mommy, daddy, grandma, grandpa, husbands, wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, dogs, cats, anything. Nothing is more important than this word. Jesus said, in Matthew 6 33 he said seek ye first the thing the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things shall be added unto you my wife doesn't want me if Jesus isn't first because if he's not first he'll be last and if he's last you don't want to have nothing to do with me but if he's first then you should want all of me because that's what God that's what my destiny is that's what your destiny is, is to keep him first, to keep him first in your life. Without Jesus first, I mean, he's last. Jesus doesn't take second place to anything or anybody. 
Amen? Amen. So, all right. Hallelujah. Today's been a great day. Well, let me get to my message. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, turn to the, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And, and we're going to begin a study that, that hopefully this is um, based on Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. This is going to be part one of a many series that I'm going to do, hopefully on Wednesday nights. I'm going to go through the book of Acts and, and de declare and piece together on how it pieces together with everything. Because as I was talking about these feast days and comparing the holy days to the holidays, you guys learned something. These are very important things. They're very important things because you got the first, the first four feast days pointed towards Jesus' first coming. You had, you had Passover. Jesus was the Passover lamb. He had to come and fulfill that feast. Then after that, you had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You had the, the, um, the Feast of First Fruits because we know when Jesus rose from the dead, that he was the first fruit of many brethren. And then fourth, you had the Feast of Weeks, which we know that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit 50 days exactly after his resurrection. 50 days after his resurrection. That's what Pente means. Pente means 50. So they were waiting. Now listen, let me ask you something. If Jesus did, if Jesus, when he was here on this earth, he taught these disciples for three and a half years. He taught them everything he wanted to teach them in three and a half years. I mean, he was Jesus. Now, if it was, if it was important for us not to celebrate these feast days, which, which baffles me why anybody would not want to honor the feast days. If Jesus did not want them to honor the feast days, he would have never told them to go to Jerusalem and tarry. Because that was his first promise. The first thing that he told them when he resurrected from the dead, he said, listen, you've got to go back to Jerusalem and wait for what the Father has promised. Because listen, if Jesus, if his promise to us was to send the Holy Ghost, and Jesus never sent the Holy Ghost, then he lied. And if he lied, you might as well throw the book in the garbage can. Listen, I'm very serious about this being the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I mean, we've got a base for eternal salvation on what this book says. It's extremely important. So Jesus told them to go back. Look in Acts 1. Acts 1. Listen to this in verse 3. Acts 1, 3. It says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them over a period of 40 days and teaching them things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, here's my question to you. If Jesus walked on this earth for 30 years and he chose these disciples to walk with him, then they walked with him for three and a half years every single day. I mean, these guys left their jobs. They left families. They left everything and just came and walked with Jesus. And I mean, every day, listen, they saw Jesus raise people from the dead. They saw Jesus do incredible miracles. But more importantly, he spent every single day with them. He taught them every single day. So what's the importance of that? Importance of that? What am I getting at? Well, it says that he had to come back for 40 days and teach them things concerning the kingdom. What was there that Jesus could not have taught them in three and a half years that he had to come back for 40 days and teach them. There's nothing that Jesus couldn't have taught them. As a matter of fact, Jesus could have just imparted it in them and they could have known the truth. But there were things that he had to come back and teach them in his resurrected body. For 40 days in his resurrected body, he taught them things concerning the kingdom of God. 
Th that's something for you to think on all week. And the first thing that Jesus told them to do was, he said, in verse 4, he said, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Listen, these feast days are, they're incredible truths. Because when Jesus came to this earth, I'm telling you something. He came to fulfill the Passover. Those are the three high holy days. Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. So when Jesus came, they, the Jews, listen to this, they were celebrating the day of the Passover. They were preparing the lamb as Jesus came riding into town on that donkey and as he was examined by Pilate, the Jews were examining that lamb that was to not have no, a spot or blemish. It was a perfect, no broken bones, a perfect lamb that was going to be sacrificed on the Passover. Everything pointed towards Jesus. So that was the first major feast that Jesus had to fulfill. Then after that, as soon as he came out in his resurrected body and he taught them, Listen, for 40 days. Yeah. Well, they had to tarry for 10 days. How do we know that? Because he resurrected, and we know that 50 days after exactly is the day of Pentecost. It's the Sunday after the, the seventh week, that Sabbath. You have seven times seven is 49. The next day would be the Sabbath, and that would be the 50th day. Pente means 50. So Jesus' promise was, look, you go and tarry. Where? Anywhere in the world? No. He told them they had to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where they celebrated the Feast of Pentecost. All the Jews went to that city. That's why, like I showed you even on Jesus' birthday, people think December 25th. That's a lie. Jesus' birthday is not December 25th. We're, at, we're worshiping Satan cause or Santa Claus or whatever you want to call him. Jolly Saint Nick. I mean, that's not Jesus' birthday. Listen, everybody wants to have something special on their birthday. Jesus was the son of God that, not, that even people who serve him don't even know what his birthday was. I mean, that bothers me. I'm thinking people that say they're Christians and serve Jesus, they don't even know when his birthday is. And not even not serving on the right day, they're serving some other man on a complete another day. But that just shows us we don't know the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help us God. I mean, I'd like to know. So, he said that you were, he commanded them, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise which the Father, which he had said, you have heard from me, from John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom, of, restore the kingdom back to Israel? See, that's what the Jews were waiting for. Why? Because we know this. We know, hey, what did we learn? The first four feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, the weeks, seven weeks, 49, the day after is 50. Those four feasts pointed towards Jesus' first coming. The final three feasts, which all fall in October. So October, you have October 1st, the Feast of Trumpets, when they blow the trumpets, declare, listen, get ready, the king may come back this year. The Day of Atonement, which is October 10th, 
And then mid-October 14 is the Feast of Tabernacles, where God promised that he would come back again and tabernacle, live again, build his kingdom on this earth. The three high holy days was Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So when Jesus came back, the Jews knew this. They said, Lord, okay, we know he fulfilled the Passover. Here he is telling us 50 days. They knew what was 50 days. They knew what the next feast was. It was the Feast of Pentecost. And they said, listen, hey, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of, to Israel? And, and look what he told them. He told the Jews, his closest followers at that time. He said, listen, it's not up for you to know the times and the seasons. It wasn't up to them, for them to know. Well, the other man that we looked at was Daniel in the book of Daniel. There are only so many people in the Bible that the angel Gabriel was dispatched to. I mean, real men that got a real angel. I mean, I try to be the best that I can. I try to go, grow, grow as close as I can to God. And, angel, and Gabriel's never visited me. But the Holy Ghost visits me. The Holy Spirit visits me. He tells me. He shows me. That's how I learn what I learn. So Gabriel said in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 there, Daniel 9, all three of those chapters, he said, Hey, Daniel, I was dispatched to come to you to tell you, to reveal to you, to tell you the interpretation of your dream. And what Gabriel told him is he couldn't tell him. He said, because it was not up to them to know. It wasn't up to them to know. But he said, listen, there, there'll be a generation. There'll be a generation. There'll be a people. Jesus said in Matthew 24, these same disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 24, like from verses 1 to 5, and they said, Lord, they said, tell us. What will be the sign of thy coming and the end of this age? And Jesus said, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. You think about what we're hearing today. He said, there'll be earthquakes in diverse places, earthquakes in places that we've never seen them before. Pestilence. Pestilence is an incurable disease. Something like AIDS. I mean, we have, we have a disease like cancer. It's incurable. We have something like AIDS that's incurable. We have the diseases that have just hit the earth. We are living at a time to where wisdom and, and medication and the things that mankind are doing now have never been done in the history of the world. Stem cell research and the things that we're doing is just mind-boggling. But yet, if you get bit by a mosquito, they're worrying about it killing babies and all this stuff happening. You get Ebola that's coming into our country. You're thinking, well, that, how are they going to stop that? What are they going to do with that? All these incurable things. Wisdom is at, a, at the highest point that it's ever been in the history of the world, but yet all these things are just swirling around us. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, the end is not yet there yet. It's just the beginning. But we know that we've entered into this season. It's like the beginning of the end. How close are we? I, I can't tell you how close we are because I don't know. I just know we're close. Jesus said, as birth pains come upon a woman, they, they begin further apart and they're not as severe. But the closer she gets to giving birth, they come more rapidly, closer together, and the pains are so much more severe. Now, as we look at this, we see Jesus told them, look, it's not for you to know when I'm returning. But then he, gave, he said, like in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, he said, an evil, an evil, a perverted generation, the sons of darkness, they're the ones that don't know when Jesus is coming back. Jesus specifically said this there in 1 Thessalonians 4. He said, I don't want you to be uninformed. 
Listen, I was uninformed. I was uninformed on what I believe is the most important information for me to know while I am breathing. And when I started to think, hey, I have not been being told the truth. You tell me the truth and let me decide on what I want to do and how I want to do it. Don't mislead me, especially by worshiping idols. I think that's pretty serious. But they said this, they said, verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know that times, remember the Mohadines, they are divinely appointed times by God. That word there and, and or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. They are Mohadines. They are divinely appointed times by God. Okay, we studied the blood moons and we saw what happened when, when God divinely put a blood moon in the sky. He did it on the, on the specific times in history. You can go back and study history and find out when he put these blood moons in the sky. Well, it's called a tetrod, and he would do it four times in one year. And every single time it would fall on Passover. Now listen, it wasn't a day before Passover. It wasn't a day, one day after Passover. And then that same year, it would fall on a Feast of Tabernacles. Not a day before and not a day after. And then the next year, it would be, it would be two years back to back. The next year, it would the blood moon, God would put it right there for a reason. For all mankind to know, Genesis 1.14, he said, I put the sun, moon, and stars in the heaven for you. N not just for night and day. He said for this, for times, for Mohadim's, for divinely appointed times by God, times that we would understand. So when Jesus looked down through history, and he saw when he was going to send his son. Jesus just didn't come to die on the cross any day. Jesus came with that one purpose in mind to fulfill that feast of the Passover. And I'm telling you, it was not Easter. And it will never be Easter. Jesus is returning to this earth to set up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. It's a millennium. Everybody knows that. And I am telling you something. We will not celebrate Easter or Christmas during that reign. So why do it now? But what I want to be clear on is I'm not going to put a yoke upon you. I'm not going to put a burden upon you where you go out of here thinking that you've got to become a Jew again. Because this is not about telling people to go back and submit themselves under the old law because you can never attain salvation by honoring that Old Testament law. Your faith comes through by faith and grace and faith. That's it. That's how you get it. We're saved by grace through faith. Without our faith in Christ, we can't do anything. Now the levels that we attain, like I said at the beginning, the levels that we attain in his kingdom depend on how closer we walk with him. I'm not the same as I was 40 years ago. If I was, what am I, what do we even study for? That's what bothers me about when you ask people, well, how do you know you're going to heaven? They go, well, I accepted Jesus in 1962. I'm like, okay, so what? What's that have to do with anything? I mean, what have you done for the last 40, 50 years? What have you done for the last 10 years? I mean, what have you done to help God build the kingdom of God while we're on this earth? Because sooner or later, we're stepping off of this earth. And we will be judged according to the things that we've done while we're on this earth. That is guaranteed. We net the biggest misconception that people believe is death. We don't even die. We just step into another realm. So he said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Well, it's here for us to know. 
which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, they watched, and he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Listen, this same Jesus, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Verse 14. These all continued in one accord with... Oh, don't start that. I'll trade you in. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples altogether. The number of the names was about 120 and said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before, the mouth, before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Talks about Judas and his betrayal. We cannot get into all that right now. But go to Acts 2. Acts 2 verse 1 and it says this when the day of Pentecost had fully come now listen if Jesus had told them not to honor the feast or know anything about the feast they wouldn't be there celebrating the feast of Pentecost after Jesus resurrected from the dead as a matter of fact that was the first thing that he told them to do was to go to Jerusalem and tarry and to wait for that feast to come that God was going to send. Why? Because Jesus has to fulfill the feasts. He is the fulfillment of those feasts. The feasts are a shadow. They are what point us towards Jesus. If the people would have known what we know now when Jesus came to the earth, they wouldn't have crucified him on the Passover. And just like this, when the day, of fully the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place. This was the fulfillment of what Jesus said he was going to do. That's why they were there waiting. So listen, out of all the feast that was fulfilled, and when Jesus came and he had to fulfill the Passover on the Passover, we know that, okay, the first feast, God... And this is what I used to teach about restoration. In Acts 3.21, it says Jesus is being held in heaven until the restoration of all things. Restoration, you work something backwards in order to get it to its original condition. And I taught you this. I said, okay, and okay, in the beginning, it said, God, for God so loved the world, John 3.16, that he sent his only begotten son. So God had to send Jesus. And then Jesus had to send the Holy Ghost. So it was the Father God first. He sent his son Jesus. Now Jesus had a purpose. He said, I'll send the Holy Ghost. So when did he send them? When did the Father send Jesus? See, people don't even understand this. The Father God, because of what he spoke, he had to send Jesus on the day of the Passover. When Jesus had to feel, fulfill his mission and what he said he was going to do, he said he was going to send the Holy Ghost. And, and it wasn't just on any day. He had to fulfill the feast. So Jesus sent the Holy Ghost exactly when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Not a day before Pentecost, he would have been a liar. Not, not 51 days, not 52 days. I mean, people are worshiping now. They don't even know what they're worshiping, really. They don't know what day they're worshiping on. So now the restoration process works like this. The only way you're going to get back to God is His Spirit draws you. 
The Holy Spirit must draw you first because the carnal mind, the carnal man, cannot even accept the things of the kingdom. That's why people are spiritually dead. They don't have any knowledge of the kingdom because they've never been taught it. Why do you think people say, oh, well, you know, um, no, I don't read the Bible. I talked to someone at the gas station the other day. I was pumping my gas and I came in and I said, hey, they asked me about this and that. What do I do? I said, a pastor of church. I said, did you know I wrote a book? She was like, you wrote a book? I said, well, not really me. It was the Holy Spirit through me. I mean, I couldn't write anything. I never even went to my classes, really. I probably shouldn't tell the kids out, but I, I, I mean, I didn't like school when I was in school. And then she goes, what's it about? And I said, well, I said, it would really teach you about Jesus in the Bible. And she went, well, I wouldn't be interested in that. I mean, it really, it really broke my heart. I'm like, man, I felt bad for her. So I told her about our website and just to get on there and see and make people can do that in the own comfort of their own home. But, but it broke my heart. God first. He sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus sent us the Holy Ghost. Now, working backwards, which is restoration, the Holy Spirit has to draw us first. He sends us to who? Jesus. Then Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. He said, no man gets unto the Father except through me. So the Spirit draws us. Jesus points us, and through our acceptance of what Jesus did, his death, burial, and resurrection, we get access to the Father God. That's what restoration is. So these guys were saying, hey, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to, to us right now? Well, we know this. He wasn't going to do it then, because that was only the second feast. The, the final high holy day, the final feast must be fulfilled. The Feast of Tabernacles must be fulfilled. That's when Jesus comes back to this earth and sets up his kingdom for a thousand years for the millennium. That's when Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on this earth. Now listen, do you think Jesus can do that on any day? Do you think Jesus is going to do that on July 4th? No. Do you think Jesus would do that on Estar or Oster, the worship of the, the rabbit and the eggs? The great mystery is how many rabbits have ever laid a chicken egg? I mean, who would ever think of this stuff? Do, listen, do you think that he would come on St. Nick's birthday? Listen, St. Nick didn't Im impress Jesus at all. Jesus will return to this earth during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why he said no man knows the day or the hour. That's the mystery. Because the Feast of Tabernacles is a seven-day feast. So he could come any time during that feast. So, hallelujah. He said, Acts 2.1. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled up the whole house where they were sitting, and then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, one set upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were Jews in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. What? Why would they have to come back? Acts of the Apostles. If that's my wife, she owes me 100 push-ups. She's supposed to have her phone off. At least he's in the right she's place. cheating. Why did they have to come back during the Feast of Pentecost? Why was there so many people? Why were all the Jews in Jerusalem? Why did Jesus tell them to go there and tarry until this day? It was one of the three high holy days. They had to go back. They had to go back. And there's a reason for it. Because, okay, they knew that's when the Messiah was coming during one of those. They just didn't see the revelation. They didn't know the first four pointed towards his first coming. The last three point to his second coming. And, and out of them, seven feasts, three of them are the high holy days. They're the ones that God really honors. Two of which.
which that he is really honored through the Passover and Feast of Tabernacles. So of all the feasts, the last one that needs to be fulfilled is the Feast of Tabernacles. Hallelujah. During these three high holy days, all the Jews are required to go back to Jerusalem. There'd be like two million Jews go back to Jerusalem these three times of the year. Three times of the year. Passover, when Jesus was crucified. Pentecost, 50 days exactly after his resurrection. And the Feast of Tabernacles, which is when he will come back to this earth. Now they still dwell. The tabernacles, the Jews still to this day. What's the difference between us and them? See, that's the mystery where people really get confused. They, most of the Jews who are not Messianic Jews, who, who have not accepted Jesus yet, they're still looking for his first coming. It says they're not going to believe that it's him and really until they see the holes in his hand and, and the hole in his side that he was put there when they crucified him. So the only difference between us and them is we're looking for his second coming. They're still looking for his first coming. They know that his coming has to be during the Feast of Tabernacles. That is the time he's coming back to set up his kingdom on this earth. Gentile people don't know this yet because they haven't been taught the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's why they're not getting ready. That's why they don't know. They're not preparing for these days. I'm not making an idol out of the, out of the days. I'm just saying we honor them and we're aware to know what's happening. I don't want us to convert back to Judaism. That would defeat Jesus. You're never going to gain access into the kingdom by trying to fulfill the law. You can't even fulfill the Sabbath. People don't even know when the Sabbath is for crying out loud. How are they going to? Now, now, look what he said here in verse 14. Peter in Acts 2.14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. This was nine in the morning. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He said, And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. This is the promise. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants, and even on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit. When? In those days. And they shall prophesy, and I'll show wonders in heaven above, signs in earth beneath, blood, fire, and a vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. This is a solar eclipse. We know this. There's only been so many solar eclipses. Now, when you do see a solar eclipse within a blood moon, within those four, four blood moons, that is a, I mean, all alarms should be going off. Then he says this, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and then the moon in the blood, the moon in the blood. Well, when's that going to happen? It says before the coming of the great and awesome day of our Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Listen, before Jesus comes back, the revelation of the blood moons had to hit the church. It's a part of restoration. I remember I was on a parking lot with Steve and Steve said, hey, pastor, we're out here watching the blood moon. And he's like, man, what an awesome thing to be able to watch, knowing what we watch and prepare for Jesus and all these things that are happening and all the stuff in the earth right now. He said, well, you've taught us these blood moons have been happening since Jesus was here. There were seven, seven times it happened since Jesus was on, was here. He said, why hasn't the church ever preached it before? You never heard of it before. The reason is, is because it wasn't that appointed time. It wasn't the Mohadim yet. It wasn't that divinely appointed time by God in history. Listen, the, the four blood moons happened when Jesus was here. They happened in 1492 at the Spanish Inquisition when they tried to kill all the Jews. It happened then. 
It happened in 1948 when Israel became a nation. It happened in 1967 during the, during the famous war when Israel had to fight for Jerusalem. And it just happened this last year. Seven times. Now, they say it may not ever happen again. Or it may be another thousand years before it happens again. But when God promised us that he would put these signs in the heavens for us, that, that word means, we looked at this, it's like God sets off a flare in heaven. And he says, he declares into the earth, I'm getting ready to do something great. But listen, if you don't know what they are, you ain't getting ready. The sad part about it is, is people don't even know they have an adversary. If you don't know who the enemy is and you don't know how to defeat him, I'm telling you, you are getting ripped to shreds. You're running around. You have no purpose in life. You're broke, busted, and disgusted. You're trying to figure out why doesn't things work? Why doesn't this work? Why am I miserable? Why is this? Why am I just not happy? Hey, my wife can lock the keys in the truck. I'm still happy. The hot water tank can break. I'm still happy. I don't care. We have a flat tire. I mean, my little dolly today, out them wheels were as flat as could be. Them tires were like pancakes. That lady said, how can it be so hard to push that dolly? I looked over, them tires were as flat as flat could be. I said, that was a lot stronger than me. He wheels this thing around like nothing. But I said, okay, we just got to take something off or push a little harder, one or the other. What are you going to do? Sit there and cry over spilt milk? Listen, you've got to control your circumstances, man, or you'll be miserable. That old song said, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. Every single thing that we preach and teach points us to Jesus. We talk about the feast days, the holy days and not holidays. Why? Because they put us to Jesus. It was the greatest scheme of the devil. I'm telling you, I'm going on record before you even hear it anywhere. It was one of the greatest plots of Satan himself to change the calendar. Because if God said to honor certain days and we're not honoring them, that's not good. And not only not honoring them, we have, we have, we have worshiped pagan idols. I mean, we talked about, we talked about the holy, holiday, the holidays and holy days. And you look how twisted they are. I mean, it ain't even close. That's why we're sharing what we're sharing because we want you to know the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help us, God. We want to prepare ourselves for his coming. I believe it's a lot closer than what people think. I don't know how close it is. I mean, okay, maybe one year, maybe next year, maybe five years. I mean, that's short. The things that are happening now on this earth have never happened before. I personally believe the Antichrist is alive on this earth today. I believe he's here. It's just my own personal. I believe Jesus could come back this next year. I do believe that. So we need to be ready. We need to get ourselves ready. And we need to live that way. Hey, you could be lulled to sleep. You could just go through life, I mean, with no purpose. Absolutely miserable. The worst thing is to have an enemy or an adversary and not know it. If you don't know who you're really battling, I'm telling you, he come to do three things. He came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what the devil came to do, to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, I come that you would have life and have life more abundantly. So that's what you need to ask yourself. The thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. And Jesus said, I come that they would have life and have life more abundantly. You need to look at your own life and understand, hey, what's going on? Where am I at? What's happening? Where am I at in this whole scheme of things? Because listen, through our faith in Christ and, and the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, we can turn this thing around. 
That's the, that's, that's the good news. It's not like listening to news, the bad news. I mean, that's I like to hear some good news because believe me, there's plenty of bad news. Everybody's shooting somebody now. It's always something bad. We need to hear the good news. Amen? Thanks for being patient with me this evening. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads as I pray. Father God, we bow before you this evening and we thank you, Lord, for every single man, woman, and child that you have sent to this place this evening. We thank you for this word, Lord. And we ask that you would write it upon our hearts that we wouldn't sin against thee. Lord, give us strength to be men and women of God. Let us not be led by our own desires. Let us not be intimidated by others, but let our love, let our love for you overcome all. You told us that by this one thing shall all men know that you're my disciples. That's by their love one towards another. So Lord, I ask that you would increase this love in our hearts and in our lives and let us love one another as you have loved us. Lord, we thank you once again for this evening and for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.